Welcome. This is the February 6th Jail and Zones production user call. We have Jan, Dan, Chris, Doug, myself, Michael. I suspect others will roll in. And a broad announcement, the BSD CAN call for participation closes soon, and we are always looking for participants and sponsors. Please take a look at that. And big news, the jail descriptors review arrived from Jamie just after the last call. And I'll just bring that up because I know he had some tiny issues relating to the formatting of the diff. Did that bring it up? And I think he's resolved those. So let's take a quick look. Does anyone want to comment on this? Uh, I guess, Jan, you had some points on how he's handling some form of messaging was it yeah so he does something quite unusual and that is that uh, he, uh, through the existing jail set and get uh, system calls which take an vector of key value pairs uh, he uses an in out parameter where you can either input uh, a non a non negative file descriptor or a negative not file descriptor to request that the argument is copied out and then your canonical let's say minus 1 gets overwritten with a new file descriptor if the operation is successful which is quite unusual unusual or concerning or both uh mostly unusual and it's a strange way to create a file descriptor. But as long as notification is reliable and we are not getting back the that old socket problems where you could lose file descriptors in corner cases, then yeah, it's fine. It's just really, it could make it hard to abstract around without copying everything yet again. But okay. given that it's a tiny amount of data, it's and it's not a very frequent operation. It's fine. It's just unusual. <laughs> understood. If I understood it correctly. Um, thank um, you, Dan, for asking for clarification, and thank you, Jan, for providing some. Uh, that's Jan, do you my... want to give us a canonical example of where this would change fundamental behavior from, from how we've been doing it for decades? So one of the things it should enable but I'm not sure if it's implemented that way yet, is that it would enable creating the next jail as a descriptor. And then similar to a process descriptor, is your process dies for any reason, it runs into a sec folder or whatever. As part of process tier down, the jail would be garbage collected. So let's say you have something like a CI runner maybe with recursive jails and somewhere along the way it fails, uh, the kernel would at least the jail part would basically be garbage collected by the kernel like any other file descriptor. So that is a nice reliability feature. And as soon as there's a finer granularity rather than just inheriting all the uh, permissions of the process creating the descriptor, um, then it would be very nice because uh, Capsicum could be used. But it looks like because it didn't go through IOCTALS but uh, implemented new uh, system calls, right now you can't use, unless there's a mechanism which is for all system calls and not tied to IOCTALS in Capsicum, which I don't know of, you can't use Capsicum to restrict what you can do with a jail descriptor. So once you have the jail descriptor, even if you're an unprivileged process, by giving you the descriptor, whoever created it, implicitly gave you their credentials to manage the jail. So change its variables, um, yeah. Okay. Kill it, whatever. And the part which he says himself isn't yet implemented fully is notification via uh, KQ. But that is also uh, on the horizon. Okay, so thank you. Be nice, uh, prevent the slightly more complex way of 
implementing a new filter rather than just putting it under the read filter, which would have also been fine. For example, timer FDs or event FDs become uh, readable when there's an event. And then right. you do something with them. And you could have done the same with jail descriptors, I think. But there's nothing wrong with that approach. It's just a bit more work for him. Cool. Uh, Dan, does that help answer your question that you asked in the review? It clarifies that it's stuff that I would never use directly. So let's say you have Pudir and you want to kill a Pudir worker and you accidentally kill the master. If Pudir used jail descriptors in what I think will become the um, idiomatic way, the kernel would clean up the jails rather than having stale jails around. Okay. Uh, so, well, for, the kind for of... example, I don't think it's something that I would use in a shell script, for example. I, I, I... Yeah, you're right. There's something missing here um, to make it shell scripting friendly. And I think the best way to go about it would be uh, to add a chain loading either option to an existing command, either jail or jlexec, or uh, add a new command which would create a jail descriptor attached to a jail because you kind of want to be that, uh, you kind of want to have the jail creation be atomic uh, so that if it succeeds, you get the file descriptor. If not, the jail hasn't been created. So it makes sense to put it into jail, not jxec in my opinion. And the feature I would like to see is for it to be able to start with jail and then pass the jail descriptor to a child process or exec into a process which then uh, gets an environment level telling it which file descriptor number is the jail descriptor and run with the jail descriptor. So that would make it shell scripting friendly. Doug, any observations? Is this on your radar or, or is it orthogonal? It's not really something I'm looking to use, given the lifetime model of, of CI runtime um, means that I can't have, have a, hold a descriptor anyway. So I'm just using the attach parameter, the um, persist parameter to jails to, to control the lifetime. That oh. won't be compromised in any way, and you can do that. Oh, no, I, I don't expect it to, to change because that would break pretty much. But everything. to implement the OCI runtime, do you need st reliable state change notifications? Not so, really. if, for example, the jail uh, exits on its own or someone else destroys the jail manually, does the OCI container runtime need to be notified about that? And no, would what, it be nice to do that without polling? What typically happens is the so the the common um, monitor program has keeps track of the PID of the container the main container process and it reaps everything when that exits. That's that's the 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 um, event driven part of it there is polling for the container state so you can ask the runtime hey how's my container it can go it's exiting sorry mate or it's still running great um so that is possible but um i don't think we rely on on um polling for this it's mainly around monitoring the main pid of the of the container so sick child or uh kq uh process id it, it based doesn't or, wait or yeah i can't PD4 i can't remember how where I left you? It. yeah yeah i can't remember how where i left it with with common i think it's doing i think it's using kq to to monitor the pid i'd have to read the but, code again i conmon almost never changes i haven't touched it for about six months so conmon is the direct parent process of the um primary container process? Yeah. 
in that case, traditional Unix APIs for well, actually, it's not, that's not quite true. Enough. That's not quite true, actually. The so what happens is the um, so Conmon execs the OCI runtime yep. um, with a command line argument for a file to put the PID of the main of the uh, the container's main process, and then it waits on that PID. Okay, so Vasey, but uh, possible without yeah. calling yeah. because you can use KQ to attach to a PID if you have the right uh, capabilities. Yeah. yeah. Anything else relating to that? I don't think so. Cool. Uh, Doug, other news from your desk, if anything. So um, let's see, the um, OCI runtime working group is is just starting to come together. Um, we have a GitHub um, repository. Um, I'll try and paste a link to the repository in the chat. You read my mind. Minute. <laughs> <laughs> so basically, uh, the, this this is a, a place to put um, Issues, quest for questions, um, pr pull requests for you know proposals of how you think that things should work or how um, there's a, a the way things the way they, they normally do things is a requirements document and they put use cases, basically just a list of use cases, which is great. So you, um, anybody can um, make a pull request to add their list of, of use cases that they care about. I put a few in the file yesterday. Great. Um, let me let me just grovel around and find the link. Yep. Cool. Chris, while he does that on the topic of working groups, and thank you who's ever correcting my notes. I always appreciate that. Um, Chris, any news on the technical ones or perhaps uh, more community ones? I know there was a, I think there was a meeting last Friday, was it? You're muted perhaps, or you're muted, not muted and your audio is toast. Haven't heard a word from you. Ah, thank you for that link, Doug. Yeah, Chris, fun, fun, fun. Reboot. Yeah, I hear you. I saw you on there twice. What, okay. Uh, one, one extra thing. One extra thing for the working group. Um, so OCI has a Slack instance, and um, they use, typically use that for general chat as well as more focused stuff. So I created a um, chat channel on the OCI Slack. For, for the working group. I mean, this should just be for sort of out of band communication, long term, sure. you know, for, for actual discussions on on what we're going to do, that should be discoverable, we should keep a history and that's what the um, GitHub is for. But having a Slack channel is kind of useful. Um, okay. I understand that this has work has to come first, mm -hmm. but is anyone already looking then one or two steps ahead toward uh, CNI um, and so that we could have uh, container network interfaces using the FreeBSD had, specific features. I already have CNI. I, 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 we've had CNI for more than a year. And how would you express FreeBSD specific features like NetGraph or um, the VNet setup? for VNet enabled JLs. So the VNet is describing what you want, the, how you want the VNet to be set up. That's in the province of the OCI runtime. And that's part of what we're going to standardize in the working group. So how to describe which parts of the namespace you want to inherit, which parts of them you want to have private and so on. VNet being one of those. Um, CNI then, so the the order of things is we create the jail with the the relevant namespaces, including VNet, set up the way you want them. 
And then between then at that point thing is paused. We haven't started the container, but we created it. Then CNI runs and basically injects state into the into the VNet, like creating um, an e pair, putting one half of the e pair on the host bridge, the other half into the container, that kind of thing, filling in um, with addresses, that sort of stuff. So it's a two step thing. Um, what else is there? I haven't even thought about NetGraph. I guess I I implemented the CNI bridge uh, module just using um, FreeBSD's bridge. If bridge works great. Um, literally, the only things I do in the CNI runtime it's it's not a full featured one. It's got a bridge module that does that sets things up, creates an e pair, plums it plums it together with a container. It's got a uh, port map which sets up PF rules to allow the container to publish ports into the host. And that's it, really. Very simple. There are some questions. Do, 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 how do I want to go? Uh, go ahead and let's just punch through that. Uh, Jan, you have a question regarding uh, do, 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 VLANs. Yeah, the question is, where would this configuration even belong in this model? We, um, okay. Because so, my understanding is that this would be specific to a CNI backend, which would yeah. then be available on FreeBSD and maybe others. Okay. So this this is sort of getting into the, the uh, Kubernetes territory where the CNI um, modules typically are more complicated than the, the simple desktop use case with a traditional Docker or Podman would, would use. Um, so I've experimented with this. I've written, um, I've started working on the way, the way things work, let, let me get my thoughts together. The way things work with Kubernetes is we run a container and, and then that container is a privileged container with, with access to, to some aspects of the host and typically creates a, a creates the host bridge plums it together with a vxlan or whatever and and then creates the um, cni configuration in, to allow cni to basically add things to that bridge i experimented with writing a shell script where actually I think we ended up with Python, a Python version of, of one of these that created a bridge, plumbed it together into with a VLAN and I looked at, looked into VXLAN but didn't really care that much because I don't need VXLAN in my home lab. So it's quite possible to do this, this kind of thing with simple bridges and um, a little bit of Kubernetes kind of front end to create the bridge and initialize it, connect it to the right right to network resources. So I yeah. looked into FreeBSD's VXLAN and it's there, but we don't have any integration with any of the dynamic routing demons uh, available as ports to truly implement a multi protocol BGP-based overlay. So you either have to right. do point to point uh, or you can use the private interface link. Uh, sorry, the private interface feature of the FreeBSD bridge to basically break the loop without using spanning tree so that all the XLAN mm -hmm. interfaces on the bridge would be private, which means a packet received over one of them would not get uh, forwarded to any other VXLAN, which breaks the loop, and then you could have a broadcast, uh, basically a source uh, replicated broadcast, yeah. which doesn't scale, but is easy to operate uh, for a handful of systems. So I didn't look at so perfect look for very hard at BGP. Right. Um, I in my lab scale network, um, basically all of the nodes are bridged onto a single VLAN. 
and I only have a single Ethernet fabric in my house. So that works. Yeah. With BXLAN, it can um, potentially perform the same role. I started looking at it. I couldn't get it to work and didn't try very hard um, because VLANs was going to work for me. Sure. My um, understanding yeah. of uh, from that was that the node discovery stuff was done using local multicast. Yeah, if and you can use multicast point, point to point. Let him finish. And then, then with the multicast, would discover the the um, upper IP address of that of that node, and then keep a, a hash table and do point to point. And, um, for the with the VXLAN protocol, exactly. Yeah, yeah. Anything without uh, entry in the forwarding database gets multicasted. Yeah. So with the, um, I think I was using. I looked into using BGP with my PFSense to uh, publish which IP address range. Um, a given node was going to use, but it was so much easier to use VLAN. So they just share a single address space, and each node has a, a subset of that address space, and they talk to each other using level two. I looked um, into IP. both uh, free range routing and BERT, and neither of them yeah. implement for a necessary integration because uh, BGP signaled uh, the XLAN is basically two interfaces, a bridge and the VXLAN interface, kept in sync by the routing daemon. So now it basically via BGP has to pre-populate the forwarding uh, databases of both the bridge and the uh, VXLAN interface and keep, keep all of this in sync. And if you use it exclusively, disable the broadcasting mechanism and sniff the missing packets. So I looked into, into some Linux um, CNI implementation, one which is interesting and kind of I thought of when we were talking about um, BGP is something called Calico, Yes, which um, actually is really nice. I, I run up a, a small cluster of Linux nodes uh, using Calico, it's super easy, just worked. Uh, it's, it, coordinated its BGP seamlessly after I finished setting it up with my PFSense, and it was great. Um, the downside yeah. is that it's heavily heavily dependent on eBPF, which is kind of a, currently a showstopper. So I haven't I look tried to think about how to get Calico to work on, on FreeBSD. It might be possible, but like I said, for my use, current use case, it's overkill. I looked into it a while ago, and Helico at the time at least looked to me like for once, whoever implemented the networking for a container runtime wasn't afraid of actually networking. Yeah. <laughs> because oftentimes yeah. it's just a uh, bridge, 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 uh, keep everything layer two, maybe port forwarding and uh, IPv4 only. And instead, they just use routing and static access control lists, which is so much easier to conceptually once you've understood IP routing. Uh, but I haven't kept up with the development there, but just basically keep prop. So they, I don't know if the patch sets got maintained, but there used to be patch sets for BERT for both PF tables and uh, IPFW tables. Right. So that you could use uh, BGP to synchronize uh, uh, firewall tables for the two actually used uh, firewalls in FreeBSD. Uh, I know IPF refuses to die, <laughs> but um, no comment. The nice thing is that then you can basically implement the concept which Calico advocates at the time by just basically keeping IPFW or PF tables in sync where you would have one set of 
addresses per tenant, and then they are allowed to uh, speak to each other and some external system, but not to the other tenants. And that's just like two or three lines, uh, sorry, rules uh, in IPFW or uh, in PF as well. Okay. Perform quite well. Anything else relating to routing and BGP and you name it? Yeah. Uh, I'm definitely curious, but uh, that's uh, to be investigated. And thank you for pushing those limits, Jan. Okay. Anything else on that broader topic or should we open up in other directions? And Chris, are you with us? I hope so. There Does he it is. Finally Welcome. Work? Excellent. Hey, it's just a repo. You know, I was looking at MacBook Pros yesterday at the shop, and I guess uh, Apple is finally telling me just to buy it. I don't know. <laughs> um, it just broke. I don't know why. I read your email. I cannot tell you anything about that call. Unfortunately, it wasn't part of it. Okay. And I, uh, I'm thankful for your reminder uh, towards the enterprise working group because I have to admit that the past few weeks have been very strongly focused on just hacking away myself and I should uh, refocus a little bit on the community work because we still have this kind of question open um, how to, well, what, what, what this minimum viable product would look like. Um, so we can bring in some developers and, and potentially also get some funding from, from the foundation for that. And I think it would make sense to do that, to, to really follow up on that. Amen. Uh, I do have some thoughts there. They might be a bit orthogonal, but congrats on hacking. That's not a bad thing. Um, well, cool. And let's see, Dan, do you have any open bits of news or questions? You've had no. some... Great question. Nothing here. Weeks. Cool. Nothing here. And Jan, you have a brief architectural update on jailhooks. Uh, I just had a look at uh, the, the parser rules for it and was tempted to just put a big if dev in there to uh, use libucl instead. Uh, but, yeah. Okay, cool. Let's see. Um, if you have an amazing employer, please ask them about BSD CAN. I've reached out to dozens of companies and will continue to do so. Uh, the CFP is closing soon. I, I don't know. I suspect some of you will be there. It's a fantastic event. And thank you, Dan, for your nearly two decades of making that happen. You're Anything welcome. else, or shall we call it good? I heard someone interject there. No, I said you're welcome. Oh. <laughs> I've got a question for Jan, but um, that can't be off call as well. Uh, topic? Because we've had way too many great conversations right after the recording stops. So is. try it. I'll, I'll set you straight if it's off topic. <laughs> hey, good. I just threw some cool. uh, BM st uh, state D uh, yeah. report. Okay. So, uh, yes, exactly. Um, they, I mean, first of all, thank you. I mean, they, they've been great, really, because, you know, I started spinning my head around that. And I think we're lacking context. It would be more on topic uh, and, and uh, today's cool. the first day and he's breaking up for me. Yeah, yeah, we've frozen. And, uh, okay, so yeah, that MacBook Pro, um, I guess, is going to One of it. the points that you raised was uh, right, the port of the MCD and the code it, unfortunately, was that this thing always was successful, even if the startup actually failed, because what I what I did is basically I... I wrapped reading the configuration and everything into the process that was forked off. Yeah. Basically, the thing forked, and it was always successful. And then <laughs> reading the configuration failed, and the sub process and the RC script never realized that actually the startup failed. So I have everyone's a winner. That, know. Yes, I've, everyone's a winner, exactly. So I fixed that. However, um, 
Jan, you um, you put in the comments something about uh, different exit codes, and the, the the way I have it at the moment is that the RC script actually returns uh, error code one when it fails, and I'm wondering whether that is the right thing to do or whether there is a better way to do this, because well, anything non-zero would be fine. Oh, you mentioned I, I actually I never I I've never seen that, but I think it's great. Yeah, okay. Uh, Support Sorry, for sysexit.h is not universal. Uh, it's okay. BSD specific. Uh, for BSD specific tool, I think it's a good idea to follow this convention mm -hmm. if it makes sense, which in that case, I think it does. And what you can do uh, in a forking daemon is to basically you create a pipe and you close it when you are happy and otherwise uh, you send the exit code for it. The exit code is so small that it will always be atomic. And basically you, the child process sends over the pipe, the exit code to its grandfather process. Are you still with us? He's chopping up, and I will leave on one single point, which is there is a manual page, perhaps SysExit, which I learned yes. about about 20 or 25 years late, yep. which is like here a, you know, by nature. I don't know if it's SysExit. So you, can you, that sure doesn't look right, but there's one that lists like the nature of the exit, and wow, I wish that were better documented and implemented. I'm looking at some possibilities. Jan, do you know which one that which page that is? Yes, I put it in chat. It's oh, exit in category three. Excellent, uh, thank you. So just look at a so it's ancient from 4.3 BSD, not free BSD4, but BSD4. Okay, okay. Uh and yeah. Cool. So, Basically, Chris, I hope it's... that answers your highest level question on how yeah, should absolutely. I absolutely. pick out an exit, because I you. was shocked that there was like some notion of, hey, we thought about this decades ago. Uh, so I will put that in the notes. Anyway, thank you, everyone. I think I'll just call it. And if you want to go informal, let's do it. And yes. then there's the other little detail that uh, VM State D uses a private ABI. Exactly. Yeah, with UCL. Yep. For a port, it wouldn't be hard to just uh, pull in libucl from ports. And then there's the uh, limitation you already documented, uh, thankfully, in the man page that VM state D, once it considers a guest failed, has no alternative uh, to recover it without we are starting VM state D, which would restart all guests which is kind of the, the limitation which keeps it a toy. OK, Correct. thanks to audio trouble. Actually, Let's I, call it there. As an I actually put that feature in a, in a recent update. Yeah. <laughs> so so at least with maybe, the next version, that is possible to reset the state Yeah. Yeah, or just have the uh, uh, VM state CTL uh, Um, oh, wait, if you I found another problem. If you call VM state DCTL without arguments, it's sec faults. That, that I also fixed in a new version. <laughs> I have the, okay. I have the, the zero, zero, uh, 005 version. I have that already. On that cheery note, like and subscribe. Like Catch you perhaps tomorrow for some calls. For like Thank and you, subscribe. everyone. <laughs> Exactly. So maybe okay. just either add a clear Thank command you. or have the start command implicitly clear the oh, failure. Like okay, great. Uh, yeah, there's some transmission issues there. Thank you, Chris, Dan, Jan, I'm, and Doug especially. I'm happy to stick around a little bit, but let's call it, okay? Like and subscribe.